Chair of the Committee at any time. Now, pursuant to Committee Rule 2E and House Rule 112H4, the Chair announces that he might postpone roll, calls, roll call votes. Today we meet to consider H.R. 4489, the FAA Leadership and Groundbreaking High-Tech Research and Development Act, or Flight R&D Act. Pursuant to notice, I now call up H.R. 4489, the FAA Leadership and Groundbreaking High-Tech Research and Development Act, or Flight R&D Act, and the clerk will report the bill. H.R. 4489, a bill to provide for Federal Aviation Administration Research Mr. and Development. Chairman. And the I'd like to make a statement before she proceeds with the bill. Okay. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point, and the ranking member is recognized for her statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Until one hour ago, uh, we had some agreements, and I'd hope that today we could have a nice bipartisan uh, markup. Unfortunately, it does not look like that's the case. My staff has asked for a delay. We are on a markup in transportation dealing with the same subject and many of the same members on that committee. Um, on Monday afternoon, my staff received the majority's bill being marked up today. After reviewing the bill, I did request that the staff reach out to the majority to determine if some kind of bipartisan compromise could be reached for today's markup. Our staff discussed the changes on the bill on Tuesday, and uh, on Wednesday morning, an agreement was reached on changes to the bill, which would have led to my support of the bill at today's markup. We memorialized those changes in an amendment, which I would offer, and the majority staff confirmed their support for this plan yesterday afternoon. However, at 6.43 p.m. yesterday evening, we were provided with eight new Republican amendments, the substance of which had been discussed with my staff during the negotiations. Several of these amendments were immediately uh, recognized uh, by my staff as being amendments which we could not support. And now I have a suspicion that these amendments were drafted by the minority staff, majority staff and provided to their members. However, even if they weren't conceived by majority staff, they clearly would have known about these amendments while we were negotiating in good faith with the majority to reach a bipartisan compromise. Note that the date and time stamps on the amendments indicate that many of these amendments were drafted within a two-hour period on March 8, um, Monday the 8th. For the majority to, majority to have been working on these amendments at the same time we were negotiating in good faith towards a compromise is, to put it bluntly, bad faith. Now the majority also decides to reschedule this markup at a time which coincides with the Transportation Committee's markup of the main FAA reauthorization, despite the fact that four of our members sit on that committee and several of, of the members of the majority, including myself. Uh, we have known for the past year that we needed to mark up FAA R&D bill. We could have done this months ago instead of spending the committee's time on a partisan political hearing and now we uh, hearings and now we are trying to jam this bill through this afternoon. Frankly, if the majority is going to negotiate in bad faith, the minority, if you're going to sandbag us with poison pill amendments at the 11th hour, and if you're going to knowingly inconvenience members with markup conflicts, then I don't really feel the minority needs to be a part of this process. Uh, I will head back to the Transportation Committee and uh, I, where I feel that we'll get a fair markup, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Um, I should say, if you want to consider offering your amendment, we could do that now. And if you don't want to, that's your privilege. Uh, to, the Chair, remaining, to the remaining, Mr. just Mr. Minute, Chair, I request uh, a recess. To the remaining members, I do just want to say that we have 15 amendments. Uh, 10 are, I believe, bipartisan and will be agreed to. 10 of the 15 and half of those are Democratic amendments. Uh, the other amendments uh, are going to possibly be controversial, but that's the whole point of a markup, and we consider any amendment that anyone wants to offer. Who wishes Mr. Chairman, to I request a recess. The gentleman request recess. is recognized. The gentleman from Florida. Thank you. I request a recess. Make a motion for recess. Uh, question is on agreeing. Uh, to the motion to recess, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. Opinion chair, the noes have it. Mr. Chairman, I suggest the absence of a quorum. Okay, but how do we prove that? 
suggested we that. Have. Okay. Uh, the, uh, let me respond to the gentleman by saying that all we need, I believe, is one third of the members to have a quorum, and we have a quorum. I would say uh, that's not correct. Um, I would say it's one half, not one third. But in any case, I suggest the absence of a quorum. Okay. And I don't believe in either case that's the case that you have enough. <laughs> okay. We'll uh, we'll take account momentarily. All right. Okay. Well, I guess the motion is moot at this point since. Uh, okay. <laughs> Be a quicker markup than we thought. Um, what's the next? Uh, you can read your opening statement. Okay. Um, if I don't do that, are you ready for the motion? Um, to the amendment make sure it's Well, that, I think we'll just do all, all that has the Democrats in it. So Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, so questioning a quorum is always in order, and it's um, never moot. Always, okay. Uh, we are getting there. I didn't realize you were coming back. Uh, so how do we proceed with the uh, quorum count? No, no, uh, don't we call it a little bit. Yeah, you can, you can say if the gentleman wishes to insist on yeah. his motion to recess, we will... Take a roll call vote. Okay. Uh, we will take a roll call vote to determine whether a quorum is present or not. Mr. Smith. Present. Mr. Smith is present. Mr. Lucas. Present. Mr. Lucas is present. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Rohrabacher. Mr. Rohrabacher is present. Mr. Nagabauer. Mr. McCall. Mr. Brooks, Mr. Holtgren, I, I don't, I don't Mr. Know. Holtgren is present, Mr. Posey, Mr. Posey is present, Mr. Massey, Mr. Bridenstein, Mr. Bridenstein is present, Mr. Weber, Mr. Weber is present, Mr. Molinar, Mr. Knight, Mr. Knight is present, Mr. Babin, Mr. Babin is present, Mr. Westerman. Mrs. Comstock. Here, present. Mrs. Comstock is present. Mr. Palmer. Here. Mr. Palmer is present. Mr. Laddermilk. Present. Mr. Laddermilk is present. Mr. Abraham. Present. Mr. Abraham is present. Mr. LaHood. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Lofgren. Mr. Lipinski. Ms. Edwards, Ms. Bonamici, Mr. Swalwell, Mr. Grayson, Mr. Barra, Ms. Esty, Mr. Vesey, Ms. Clark, Mr. Beyer, Mr. Perlmutter, Mr. Tonko, Mr. Tacano, Mr. Foster, Are there any members who have not been counted? And the clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, we have 14 members present. Okay, a quorum is present. I am going to um, submit my opening statement for the record, and we will begin with the First Amendment to be offered uh, by Mr. Loudermilk, gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my amendment. Okay, and the clerk should report the amendment. Amendment to HR forty four eighty nine offered by Mr. Loudermilk of Georgia. Amendment mem amendment okay. number zero zero four. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my amendment will potentially save lives by making our civil airways safer for pilots and passengers. It will direct the FAA to prioritize the most important R&D activities in its portfolio and will facilitate aviation safety research that our nation depends on. I'm an Air Force veteran and a private pilot, and I fully understand the importance of the many aspects of aviation safety and the role that research plays in improving the stability of flight operations. 
My amendment keeps the authorized spending levels in the bill at the same overall levels as proposed by the FAA's National Aviation Research Plan while directing nearly $20 million a year to aviation safety. Here are some of the critically important items that FAA aviation safety research supports. Fire safety, aircraft icing, catastrophic failure pre prevention, structural safety, aeromedical research, weather programs, aviation cybersecurity, human error, and drone collision avoidance. In my experience as an aviator, I have I had to be concerned about every one of these factors at one point or another. And our nation must remain ahead of the curve in order to avoid disasters in our constantly evolving airspace. A few years ago, Mr. Chairman, I was called at 7 o'clock in the morning <clears throat> as a member of a search and rescue team with the Civil Air Patrol of a missing aircraft that uh, wasn't very far from where we operated our search and rescue. It was in the North Georgia mountains. The gentleman had taken off from an airport in, in South Georgia along the coast, was heading to Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, never, never reported in, never landed. We were alerted at 7 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning, and it was determined instead of flying the mission, they actually needed more help because of the rugged terrain, leading a ground, true, uh, ground crew in to uh, search for the pilot. By the time we got into position, our air crews had spotted the crash, but unfortunately, by the time we got to the crash, the pilot had deceased. He had survived the crash, and he had the, the fortitude to crawl out of the plane, write a note to his family, and had his bags of medication next to him. As one of the first members on the scene, I had the, the unfortunate responsibility of reading the note to his family, which he knew that he would not survive that crash. This crash could have been prevented and lives saved with proper aviation safety training. As an incident that happened in 2013 also reminds me of why safety research is so important. A small jet with two pilots was flying over Kansas when it entered an area with severe icing, which, is called, which caused the flight instruments to malfunction, a situation that not as severe, but I have been in myself. The pilots became disoriented, and while trying to manually guide the flight, uh, so much ice had accumulated that they lost control of the plane, it crashed. This kind of accident demonstrates that the FAA's aviation safety research is essential to maintaining the security of our airspace and must not be underfunded. My amendment also comes at a time when the EPA is receiving $8 billion a year in appropriations, and as we have learned in this committee, the EPA is regulating businesses into the ground. On top of that, virtually every other federal agency, almost every other federal agency, is also doing some, some form of environmental research, and there is no shortage of taxpayers' dollars going to these projects. But civil aviation safety is only conducted by the Federal Administ Aviation Administration. But the administration still doesn't seem to think that this is enough. The President's budget request, which was released earlier this week, asked for 166 percent more funding for FAA environmental research as compared to when the President took office. Unfortunately, the budget request only calls, only calls for a 7 percent increase in aviation safety research funding since 2008. It's time for us to provide a counterweight to this administration's obsessive focus on the environment and make sure that our airspace is safe and secure for both pilots and for passengers. In conclusion, this amendment will focus FAA research and development on its most critical purpose, aviation safety. I urge my colleagues to vote yes, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Loudermilk. Uh, I support your amendment. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Uh, if not, uh, the question is on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. And the amendment is not is agreed to. Next up, let's see, is the amendment to be offered by Mr. Weber of Texas, and he is recognized for that purpose. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. And the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to HR 4489, offered by Mr. Weber of Texas, amendment number 005. With that objection, the amendment is considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment is a straightforward amendment that uh, hopefully all the members of the committee will be able to support. 
because in my view, ensuring the safety of our constituents in flight is and should be the primary responsibility of the Federal Aviation Administration. My amendment simply ensures that the recommended funding levels for safety research from the National Aviation Research Plan are fully funded. Specifically, if the authorized levels for safety are fully funded, <coughs> this provision will have no impact. But if for some reason safety research is shortchanged, this amendment ensures that safety funding for people preempts environmental sustainability. The fact is that the budget requests for environmental research at the FAA have ballooned over 166 percent, as the gentleman from Georgia said earlier, under this administration, but safety funding has remained flat. So this amendment simply ensures that the executive branch gets its priorities in order, putting people first. It means if it means that environmental research has to be cut in order to ensure the safety of air travelers, so be it. We should all support putting safety in people first at the FAA. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time and I urge adoption of this amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Weber. Uh, I favor this amendment and is there any further discussion? The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byers, recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I rise reluctantly to speak against this amendment. The description of the amendment, Amendment 3 on the handout, seems reasonable. It says, reduces funding for an environmental sustainability account in the event that the authorization levels for safety are not fully authorized. But the amendment itself zeroes it unless all three, safety research and economic competitiveness and mission support programs, are all fully authorized. This means you could have a 99 percent appropriation for just one of these three, say, mission support, and, and with, you know, $1,000 short. The environmental sustainability research goes to zero. It seems to be much fairer to say to the extent that which one of these others is underfunded, then, then it, it underfund the environmental sustainability too. But essentially you're doing a very small trigger to take away all of the money that could be spent on environmental research. The 166 percent, by the way, is over a seven-year period of time. And it would be important to see what that was per year. I think it comes back to more like at nine, eight or nine percent per year. So. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Byer. Uh, any further discussion? If not, the question. Point of order, Mr. Chair. The, who, uh, Point of order, uh, the gentleman from Florida is recognized. Uh, this amendment is out of order because it's not properly noticed under Rule 2B. We will check Rule 2B. Um, would the gentleman state in his point uh, why he feels it is not appropriate to consider this amendment? Well, Mr. Chair, I understand that there was notice given uh, of something back on Friday and then again on Monday this week, but not of this amendment. Uh, the rule provides that the chair shall announce the date, place, and subject matter of any committee meeting, which may not commence earlier than the third day on which members have notice thereof. Okay, with the right. exception, unless we, the chair. We may, look, we may be looking at different rules. I'm looking at Rule 2B3, uh, 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 which says, to the maximum extent practicable, amendments are to be distributed and so forth 24 hours in advance. We distributed the, um, uh, the amendments last night, which was uh, as practical as we could do, and we think that that is proper notice. Well, my uh, objection applies with equal force to the bill itself. The bill itself was not noticed properly. The bill itself is as noticed, as circulated on Monday. The bill, I am told, is, uh, is written as circulated on Monday. 
Well, Mr. Chair, um, let's examine this further. <clears throat> the staff tells me that the amendment, this amendment and other amendments were circulated to the minority okay. at 7 p.m. last night. Is that correct? Uh, the gentleman has not stated a proper um, point of order yet. I'll continue to recognize him in case he can. Yes, my point of order is that these, the, the, the bill nor these amendments are properly before the committee under mm -hmm. Rule 2B. Uh, if the chair disagrees with that, then I would uh, call for a vote on it. Okay, we'll be happy to have there's it. No vote. There's no Apparently, vote. there's no vote because it was properly noticed. Well, I appeal the ruling of the chair. Okay. And by the way, Mr. Chair, I'd point out that under Rule 2D, uh, this particular vote, as I appeal the ruling of the chair, requires a majority for a quorum, not one third. Because the gentleman did not state a proper uh, point of order, uh, the motion is out of order. No, Mr. Chair, that's and not correct. I can always appeal a ruling of the chair. There was no ruling of the, chair the, the chair just ruled that I was out of order. I'm appealing that ruling. And that requires a 50 percent quorum. Okay. We will check with the parliamentarian. Hold on. We are checking with the parliamentarian. Meanwhile, it is permissible to recognize other individuals to make statements. And at this point, we'll recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Knight, for a statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to uh, give a statement on the bill in chief. Uh, first, I want to thank the chair, uh, Chairman Smith and Chairman Babin, for co-sponsoring this uh, complete bill, HR 4489. The FAA Leadership in Groundbreaking High-Tech Research and Development Act, and for their in, in, initiative in enhancing the economic competitiveness of the American aerospace industry. I'd also like to thank the other members of this committee for their contributions they are offering to the bill in the interest of advancing a shared vision for a stronger, more efficient national aerospace system. The Flight R&D uh, Act authorizes funding levels for the Federal Aviation Administration's research and development activities through 2019 and shapes the structure of its R&D portfolio, focusing on four key areas, safety, physical and cyber security, economic competitiveness, emerging research and development fields. These priorities reflect the agency's need to react to the shifting nature of a global industry. As more governments invest heavily in their domestic aviation industries, the U.S. will need to be more proactive in developing the new standards of aviation safety, efficiency and technology. An important part of this is ensuring the FAA is responsive to the needs of the industry. This bill is just as much about accountability and coordination between the agency and the private sector as it is about alignment between the agency and Congress. That is why this legislation creates a position for an associate administrator for R&D at the FAA to coordinate and manage the agency's strategic R&D priorities. This bill pushes our government to address one of the key challenges and opportunities for our future economy, the safe, efficient, integrating unmanned aerial systems into our national airspace. It also requires the FAA to be more supportive of UAS R&D efforts to keep that scientific leadership and economic potential here in America. I am also happy to note that this bill is budget neutral and meets the government's obligation to taxpayers to address our strategic challenges within responsible budget constraints. The United States must do more but remain fiscally responsible in an increasingly competitive aerospace landscape. H.R. 4489 aligns the public and private sectors to ensure that America continues to have the safest and most productive aviation economy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Knight. Um, Did the gentleman from Texas want to be recognized as well? And 
If so, Mr. Babman is recognized for his statement. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> I'm also a co-sponsor uh, of the Flight R&D Act and strongly support this. Uh, the Flight R&D Act provides necessary direction for FAA research and development programs and activities. This bill lays a strong foundation to ensure safe and efficient air travel while facilitating the timely integration of unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs, into the national airspace system. The aeronautics research carried out by the Federal Aviation Com uh, Administration is vital to our nation's prosperity. Aviation accounts for $1.5 trillion in economic activity and $78.3 billion positive trade balance. Civil and general aviation is responsible for 11.8 million jobs in the United States and generates 5.4 percent of our gross domestic product. Put simply, aviation is one of the pillars of our economy. And while we currently enjoy the benefits of our nation's early investments in aeronautics R&D, other nations are now attempting to challenge the United States' leadership. This is particularly troubling when the largest growth sector is not here in the United States, but in Asia. In order to maintain our leadership, we must strategically prioritize our government investments, provide a competitive environment for industry, and coordinate and clearly define public and private sector efforts to maximize efficiencies and minimize duplication that may crowd out investment. In order to realize these benefits, we must be ever vigilant. The FAA must ensure that the research they support does not duplicate private sector investments. Federal intervention and support should be limited to research that is in the national interest and that the private sector cannot or will not do on its own. Without such prioritization, valuable resources risk being diluted among disparate tasks. There are also near-term challenges that research and development must address. Reports of potential cyber vulnerabilities to aircraft and next-gen systems proliferate in the press. While recent allegations may be overstated, respected, and knowledgeable experts such as the Government Accountability Office and the National Research Council have warned that cybersecurity should play a more pro a prominent role in FAA research and development programs. I want to thank Representative Knight for introducing <coughs> Flight R&D Act, and I urge all of my colleagues to support this bill. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Babin. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, let me get back to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Grayson, on what we understand is the proper procedure. And I'll read uh, from uh, Rule 2D under quorums. Majority of the committee shall form a quorum, except that two members shall constitute a quorum for taking testimony, receiving evidence, and one third of the members, that's the relevant part here, shall form a quorum for taking any action other than for which the presence of a majority of the committee is otherwise required. Uh, we checked with the House parliamentarian, and he said, as long as amendment consideration quorum is not listed as being different, then the working quorum of one third is fine. So, May I be heard on that point? Uh, I'm sorry, yes. The gentleman continues to be recognized. Well, as it specifically says, all issues that arise under 2B uh, require a majority. It says, and these are the words in 2B1, by majority vote with a quorum present. So a majority is necessary to establish a quorum, and a majority is necessary for any ruling and appealing from the chair under Rule 2B. I yield. Okay. I'm looking at Rule 2B, bills and subject to be considered, and a quorum of a majority is required if you're going to change the date, place, or subject of a committee meeting, but that is not the case here. I believe it is, Mr. Chair. As I indicated earlier, oh. I see a violation yeah. of Rule I, 2B1 and okay. Rule 2B3. And as I say, the, uh, my ruling is that only a third of the uh, presence of the members is required. I appeal and that so, ruling. Okay. The gentleman yields back. No, he said he had I, I yield back, oh. but I, I'm going to insist on the point here, Mr. Chair. Uh, according to the, the clear meaning of this rule, Rule 2B, specifically 2B1, 
you need a majority for a quorum at this point, and you need a majority as well for a vote on the appeal from the chair. You have made your ruling. And by the way, in the unlikely event that that happens, uh, I will reserve this point and raise it again on the floor of the House. Okay. The gentleman is certainly entitled to do that. I think we do we have a, a vote now or not? If, does the gentleman insist on appealing the rule? Yeah, the he did. And so what do we do? We vote on? We can, we can vote on appealing the rule. The okay. Chair. There will be a vote on tabling the appeal. Tabling the appeal. Uh, no. Actually, Mr. Chairman, I suggest the absence of a quorum first and one half of the members are required. And uh, that has to proceed. That is not, uh, uh, the gentleman will yield again. I'm not going to quote the parliamentarian again, but uh, that is not a valid point to make. Well, it's certainly so always valid, Mr. Chair, to, accept, to suggest the absence of a quorum. Yeah. And if you look at the House rules, you'll see that the absence of a quorum takes precedent over other votes, including a vote appealing there's, from. It certainly chair. takes precedent, and there's no discussion, but it doesn't mean that uh, the gentleman is correct. We don't have to vote on that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, of course there needs to be a vote. If we're talking about the presence of a quorum, how else would one determine that? Yeah. Uh, what, is you, what do you expect the vote to be on? Uh, initially, the presence of a quorum with 50 percent of the committee required, and then okay, assuming well, I, that there I've, already, I've already ruled on that, so what is the, what is the next uh, no, no, vote Mr. Chair, the Mr. Requires? Chair, whether or not it is the 50 okay. percent or one-third. The gentleman is okay. out of order. Does he wish to make a valid point and request a vote on a legitimate subject or not? Mr. Chair, I have suggested the absence of a quorum. That pr takes precedence over my other objection, which is still pending. And I call for a vote on that. Yeah. Uh, the quorum has already been established when we had a vote a few minutes ago when 14 members were present, which exceeded the one-third required. Well, Mr. Chair, first, it's one-half required under these circumstances. And secondly, it is, there's nothing wrong with suggesting the absolute requirement at the any time. The gentleman will just have to take his uh, point somewhere else, perhaps the floor, but I've already ruled on it. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman from California wishes to be recognized. You'll have to excuse me, but I, I'm having a little bit of under, misunderstanding. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. Is this that uh, you refuse to uh, uh, go along with certain demands of the minority in order to uh, bring this legislation up, and now uh, they're trying, seeing that you felt strongly about being chairman and, and trying to direct this legislation, as you have a right to be chairman, now this is an effort to prevent us from moving forward? <laughs> Will the gentleman yield? Is, is that what's I, happening, Mr. Chairman? I think Will the gentleman yield so that I think, the I think recipient we're, witness we're, can answer that question? We've established a legitimate quorum, which was one-third, so I think we're prepared to move forward unless the gentleman has another point that would be valid. Just to be clear about this, is the chair <laughs> denying a vote on whether or not a quorum is present on the basis that a quorum was determined half an hour ago. Is that the basis for uh, denying the, a the vote? The quorum has already been determined for the purposes that the uh, gentleman objected to, and we determined that we had a sufficient quorum here. All that right. Then I'll, uh, I don't accept that ruling, but I'll take it up with the parliamentarian when the, if this bill ever comes to the floor. Okay. And now I call for a vote on my objection that this is out of order under Rule 2. And a majority vote is required on that as well. Um, I, I am told that that does not require a majority vote, simply a vote of those present. And if the gentleman wants to proceed, we'll vote on that. And, uh, we'll st and will the gentleman state his point of order and the motion he requests? The point of order is that the bill, uh, this amendment, and all other amendments have not been properly noticed under Rule 2B1 okay. and Rule 2B3. And I've already ruled that that's not a legitimate point. Mr. Chair, I don't understand how one can conclude that that's not a legitimate point. It is a point of order. Parliamentary points of order can be raised as to whether matters are properly before the committee at any point. Yeah. That's why we're here. Uh, as I explained a few minutes ago, I've already ruled on that point of order. And I appeal the ruling of the chair. And uh, the gentleman appeals the ruling of the chair. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> yes, I move to table that motion. Okay. Uh, motion has been heard to table the motion that is appeal of the rule of the chair, and we will now vote on that motion. And the question is to table the gentleman from Florida's motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion is tabled. I call for a recorded vote. A uh, recorded vote has been requested. Mr. Smith. Uh, aye. Mr. Smith votes aye. Mr. Lucas. Aye. Mr. Lucas votes aye. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Rohrabacher. Yes. 
Mr. Rohrabacher votes aye. Mr. Nagabauer. Mr. McCall. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Mr. Brooks votes aye. Mr. Holtgren. Aye. Mr. Holtgren votes aye. Mr. Posey. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Bridenstine. Aye. Mr. Bridenstine votes aye. Mr. Weber. Absolutely. Mr. Weber votes aye. Mr. Molinar. Aye. Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. Knight. Aye. Mr. Knight votes aye. Mr. Babin. Yes. Mr. Babin votes aye. Mr. Westerman. Aye. Mr. Westerman votes aye. Mrs. Comstock. Mr. Palmer. Mr. Palmer votes aye. Mr. Loudermilk. Mr. Loudermilk votes aye. Mr. Abraham. Mr. Abraham votes aye. Mr. LaHood. Mr. LaHood votes aye. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Lofgren. Mr. Lipinski. Ms. Edwards. <coughs> Ms. Bonamici. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Grayson. If, if this is on the motion to table, I vote nay. Mr. Grayson votes nay. Mr. Barra, Ms. Esty, Mr. Vesey, Ms. Clark, Mr. Byer. Mr. Byer votes present. Mr. Perlmutter, Mr. Tonko, Mr. Tacano, Mr. Foster. And the clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, 16 members voted aye, one member voted nay, one member voted present. And the motion is tabled, and I move to consider in block amendments numbers four through eight as listed on the roster and move the previous question. Mr. Chair, I reserve the previous points made, and I would note that you have neither a majority for a quorum or a majority for that vote. Okay. I'm going to restate my motion. I move to consider in block amendments numbers three through eight as listed on the roster and move the previous question. And uh, the gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Chair, will you consider taking uh, amendment four out of the block, at least for an opportunity to comment upon it? Uh, Sorry, uh, you... Amendment four out of the block, at least for an opportunity to comment upon it. The gentleman is recognized to comment on Amendment 4. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. I, I'm not hostile to the amendment at all. I just worry about it a little bit. Uh, my understanding of, of the intent of, of Dr. Babin's amendment is that no funds be authorized for the Office of the Administrator if they haven't, um, as the law requires them to do, to submit their fiscal or their plan to um, by the date of the submission of the bu President's budget request. My only concern is if they miss that deadline, it appears they will have no money for the rest of the fiscal year. And do we really want to zero out the office of the administrator of the FAA because he missed a deadline? We, we need an enforcement mechanism. This just may seem like too strong an enforcement mechanism. The next amendment, for example, number five by Mr. T Posey, has the same idea, but it doesn't zero it out for the entire year. It just zeroes it out until they obey the law. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Breyer. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Babin, is recognized. Uh, and I would. Um, I understand what he's talking about, and I would suggest that they don't miss the deadline, but uh, we'll be glad to work with you. <laughs> Mr. Babin, I totally agree that they shouldn't miss the deadline. I just worry that if they do, it might affect the entire FAA for the whole year. So That's, that's why we're offering the amendment. Okay. And maybe the gentleman can continue their discussions. Uh, now to move to consider. Uh, in block amendments numbers three through eight as listed on the roster. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. Period chair, the ayes have it, and the on block amendments numbers three through eight are agreed to. Mr. Chairman. And the gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I move the previous question. Uh, previous question having been ordered, no further debate. Our amendment is in order. The question is on the amendment. question is on the bill as amended. as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the bill is agreed to. 
I move that the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology report the bill to the House of Representatives with an amendment, oh, excuse me, as amended, as amended uh, and with the recommendation that the Mr. bill be agreed to, that the bill be amended to pass. Um, before I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, let me see if anything else for me to do. Uh, the gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Chair, just a small point of order. There's not an opportunity to offer the other amendments? Um, there apparently will not be today. Uh, I know you had two amendments. Yes, sir. Is that correct? Um, can we, is it too late to accept those? We've already, we've already yeah. uh, I would have been willing to have accepted those were it not for the various uh, activities by some members of this uh, committee. So since we've moved the previous question, it is too late to offer those amendments today. I'll support your uh, desire to offer them on the House floor if we get to that point or in a conference committee if that's what it comes down to. Okay, and, and Mr. Mr. As a point of order, um, Mr. Chairman, and I'm new here, isn't it always in order to be able to offer an amendment during markup? It normally Especially, is, but not after the previous question has been moved. Uh, okay. okay. Well. I, I would appreciate your support on the House floor then. And there was, I, 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 I would expect to support those. Um, in, in regard, in re just a minute, in regard to the amendment, the ayes have it and the motion is agreed to, H.R. 4489. Uh, I'm sorry, um, let me start again. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 4489 as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed signify by saying no. And the ayes have it, and the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. H.R. 4489 is ordered reported to the House of Representatives. And before we adjourn, uh, was there another member who sought recognition? The gentleman from Colorado. Um, the point of order, I, I'd ask for a parliamentary, um, I make a parliamentary inquiry, is calling the question always in order despite a listing of a right? Yes. 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 Okay. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you all for your presence Mr. Chairman, today. Uh, the gentleman from California. Just to clear things up for me, I, I'm a little bit slow on this. Uh, if you would not have been successful in what you just did as leader, would that not have meant that the majority had given up all of its rights to actually control what this committee <laughs> does and that the minority would then be able to have a, a veto power over anything and that the we German do? The gentleman certainly could say that and I would understand his point of view and, and I appreciate his expressing that sentiment. Thank and you, the Mr. committee stands adjourned. <laughs>